Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the scene, Café Scientifique. I see that uh, 27 people are here today. Welcome again. We're going to wait a bit more so that people can connect. Too loud. Mm-hmm. Hello, everyone. So we're gonna wait uh, a bit more so that people can connect. I'm happy to see you all for this new cafe scientific. Maybe you already have your cup of coffee or tea. Sorry, I think that the music is not that good today. (laughs) Valentin is doing this better than usual than me, it seems. So we are now 33. Welcome everyone for this Café Scientifique today with uh, Jonathan Friedman from the University of Louisville School of Medicine, who is going to introduce us to the fascinating words of uh, C. elegans for toxicology testing. Uh, this meeting is recorded, uh, so you will be able to access the recording afterwards on the project website, precisiontalks.org. For those who don't know me, my name is uh, Jeanne Perouse. I work from, uh, for other talks. We are one of the partners in Precision Talks, which gather 15 organizations across Europe and the US to develop uh, safety assessments of chemical without the, new, the use of mammalian models. Um, During this webinar, we will be together for an hour and a half with John. Uh, We invite you to to interrupt us if you have any questions, so you can use the function of uh, raising your hand on the button of your screen. If you have any question, you can also, I also invite you to to write it down in the chat and we will, uh, Agatha and I will uh, will let uh, Jonathan know about your question. So, Jonathan, the floor is all yours. Thank you. So um, as you can see from the title, I'm going to be discussing how we developed C. elegans as an alternative tox testing organism. But also I want to put it in a historical perspective. So right now, a lot of things that we accept as normal or every day didn't exist when we started. So I want to kind of talk about this in the context of where we were when we began and we can see how far or not how far we've we've come. So let's get started. That's interesting. 
Okay, just to give an outline, I'm going to give some historical context. So what was going on in, in science when we began worm talks. Then I'll start talking about C. elegans as an alternative test organism. I'll give some background on the nematode itself. I'll talk about a few of the assays we developed during um, the heyday of worm talks. Talk about our data analysis. And finally, I'll talk about our screening of the ToxCast phase one and phase two chemical libraries. Let's see. Messenger. Oh, it just crashed. Hold on. There we go. So many of you are aware of this book, The Principles of Humane Experimental Technique by Russell and Birch. This book defined the three R's, which we are all aware of. It is the replacement of animals. So try and use things other than mammalian species in research. Reduction in the number of animals. So either reduce the number of animals you need per experiment or try and get more information out of each animal that you use in a study. And then refinement. So use techniques which would um, minimize pain, suffering, and distress of the animal. Now, this is, was very, um, very research focused, but um, what really brought animal cruelty or um, into the public eye in terms of basic research was the Desiree eye test. So this test was developed in 1944. Um, it was an acute ocular toxicity test. I avoided some of the more um, gut-wrenching images, but basically the chemical under um, being investigated was injected into the eye of a rabbit and you look to see what the effects were on the animal. And uh, what you can see here are um, some of the phenotypes that you saw after the exposure. Now in 1980, Henry Spira, um, one of the founder of the Animal Rights International Program, bought a full page ad in the New York Times with the header, how many rabbits does Revlon blind for beauty's sake, talking about this test. And this began to define the need to develop alternative non-animal tests. And seeing rabbits under pain with burnt eyes um, basically hit the gut of, of the popular public. It's also interesting to note that 1980 was the year that um, PETA was founded and also began um, work with the American Humane Society, which had pre was founded in, in 1877, but had previously focused on animals in the workplace, farm animals, um, animals being used in movies and on television. Um, but in 89, they began lobbying to, for the NIH to fund the development of using alternatives to mammals in, in research. So what was involved in traditional toxicology testing? So we'd use a large number of animals. It was primarily focused on mammals. So mice, rats, rabbits, guinea pigs, primates. Um, it was very low throughput. We used pathology endpoints. Um, we used dose response extrapolations over a wide range. We applied uncertainty factors. So anyone here who has read a dossier on um, a, a chemical, you'll see that basically the reviewers will look at all of the available animal data, come up with the lowest acceptable level based on animals. Then they'll multiply that level or divide that level by 10, trying to extrapolate from animal models to humans. And just to be on the safe side, they'll add another factor of 10. Um, these are arbitrary values. There's no scientific basis for why they use these, it's just they felt it was safe. Traditional toxicology testing does not depend on human epidemiology studies. In fact, in most cases, there aren't a lot. And there is almost no focus on the mode of action in biology. The primary, primary interest is what's the pathological response. So in 2007, the National Academy of Science published um, their Write up called Toxicology Testing in the 21st Century A Vision and Strategy. And in this, they propose that in the distant future, toxicology testing 
would move from in vivo animal models to in vitro using cells and cell lines. And they would look at toxicity pathways and going through high throughput robotic methodologies. Similarly, in um, 2004, the National Toxicology Program published um, their vision for the 21st century, a roadmap for the future. And in this monograph, they supported the evolution of toxicology from a predominantly observational science to a predictive science, focusing more on target specific mechanisms um, instead of classic pathological observations. So what can we learn from uh, mechanistic data? So you can begin to appreciate the individual and population heterogeneity of disease mechanisms. You can identify mechanism-based sources of human variability. So these would include comor comorbidities. You can start looking at genetic polymorphisms. You can look at age, and also you can look at co-exposures. So as we're all aware, in the real world, no one is exposed to a single chemical. There's always multiple exposures. Um, you can improve predictions of interaction across these multiple environmental exposures. You can also look at mechanisms and predict alternative outcomes. Um, you can look, again, looking at mixtures, produce, do better predictions of interactions across both environmental exposures and our endogenous exposures. And finally, you can identify mechanistic drivers of these toxicologic responses. Again, looking at, now we're beginning to look at low doses. Previously, we would look at whatever we could be exposed. Now we're trying to extrapolate down to the lower concentrations. In 2008, you had the Tox21 initiative, which many of us have heard of. It's a collaboration initially between the United US Environmental Protection Agency, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, the NIH Center, the NIH Chemical Genomics Center, and the FDA. Tox21 at that, that time focused on small molecules, and the main goals were to identify patterns of compound-induced biological responses, try and characterize disease pathways. Again, we're now starting to look at mechanisms. Wanted to look at cross species extrapolations. They wanted to begin modeling low dose extrapolations. And something I will see consistent at this time is they want to use these types of techniques to prioritize chemicals. So they weren't looking to eliminate animal studies. Basically, they wanted to say, of all the chemicals we have to look for, let's use these techniques to figure out which ones we should um, put in animals first. Then finally, they want to help develop predictive models for the responses in humans. And this figure from a, a science article by um, John Booker and Francis Collins, you can see at high throughput, we can look at you know, tens of thousands of chemicals assayed per day using cell-based and biochemical assays. Using alternative animal models, we can now look at hundreds to maybe 10,000 chemicals a year. This is compared to the standard rodent tests where we can look, usually look at 10 to 100 per year. And then human epidemiology studies, we can maybe look at one to three a year. And you can have to compare it. So we're looking at high throughput down at one end. So, um, and then you, I do not know why my computer is doing this. Oh, um, we look at high throughput at one end and you can develop, um, sorry. So human experience obviously has very relevant human, um, is relevant to humans and high throughput has minimal um, human relevance, but you can look at a lot of things very quickly. My computer is frozen, so there'll be a few seconds. Okay. There we go. Okay. So one of the reasons we needed to move away from traditional toxicology testing, and most of us are aware of this, there are limited resources. There wasn't enough money, animals, or time to test the thousands of chemicals that needed to be tested. In 2000, you had the EU Water Framework Directive, which measures, proposed to measure the quality of water in every lake and river in the EU. 
And this time, Great Britain was still part of the EU. 2018, we had REACH legislation to, to determine the health risks of all chemicals sold in the EU. You'd want to move away from traditional models um, because there are few, fewer animal welfare concerns. So you can start addressing the three R's. People also began to realize that not every organism was a suitable model for every toxicant. Um, just as a, a story, we were looking in one report, people were looking at pyrethroids. And what they were observing during pyrethroids is um, they would look at golf courses and there'd be a large amount of dead ducks every morning um, on golf courses. And what people realized is that they were spraying pyrethroids, which based on rodent studies and other animal studies, they were at a non-toxic level. However, they were extremely toxic to fowl. So the birds would come in, eat the grass and die. Um, so again, we had this, no organism is suitable for every toxicant. And you can see, we'll see that um, some animals are hypersensitive and hyposensitive to specific classes of chemicals. And we now realize that no organism can be used to model all human exposures. So also at this time, I wanted to talk about the other side or contradictory opinions. And I found this looking through some old presentations I had and this is from a meeting in 2003 where I, um, Hillary Carpenter and I co-chaired a section looking at the application of data from high throughput assays in regulatory decision making. And although I'll focus on high throughput screening assays, it's also um, included alternative animal testing. So these are just some of the summary slides. So we asked the question, can data from high throughput screening be used for this regulatory decision making? Um, the consensus of our work group was in the future, it may aid in priority setting, um, but at this time, the information is primarily limited to hazard ID and not useful in risk assessment. Um, it got to the point of you cannot use this information for making regulatory decisions at this time or in the foreseeable future. Um, what information is required? Of course, we want to validate it um, and add more assays. And this validation and adding more assays is kind of a consistent theme, and we still see it today, is that all of the assays that we develop in alternative animal testing and high throughput screening, you want them to meet all the requirements that you've established for traditional animal testing, but you also want them to do things that could never have been done before, which is, um, we constantly hear, but, um, it's kind of asking us to do things that the other guy couldn't do, even though we hadn't even shown we can do the first part. So um, it's always an interesting discussion. Okay, the question, is there a current role in the regulatory decision-making process for high throughput screening assays? The response is not currently, and in the near term, it may be useful for prioritizing chemicals, but um, not for regulatory decision-making. This just listed the criteria they wanted to see to get high throughput screening and alternative animal testing acceptable. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but it needed to be relevant, realistic. The general population had to be, had to recognize the test, needed all the confidence and stringency of animal testing. And the group said the ICVAM, um, the ICVAM validation process should be used to help make these alternative animal tests and high throughput screening tests acceptable in the regulatory arena. Um, so can regulatory decisions be made on a mixture based of the perturbation of one step in a pathway, like affecting a receptor? Um, the part I like is the use of this data may be very limited. Now keep in mind when these discussions were made, AOPs hadn't been thought of yet. So AOPs, became popular or public in 2012. Um, so um, this is a decade before AOPs showed up. So the, from the National Toxicology um, Program Roadmap for the Future, I just pulled this paragraph. Um, this is kind of where worm tox began. So the NTP will continue to explore the use of non-mammalian vivo assays as potential alternative models. 
Um, the NTD project using CL ligands should be completed in three years. We actually met that deadline. Um, then based on CL ligands, looking at developmental neuro and behavioral toxicants, they, the NTP can evaluate other non-mammalian species. At that time, the focus um, moved to, to zebrafish. We wanted to look at medium throughput screens. So what are some of the advantages of alternative species? Again, this is preaching to the choir, but at the time, the US EPA was beginning to require multiple species in toxicologic tests, recognizing that some species are hyper, hypersensitive or hyposensitive. Um, the three R's using non-vertebrate species was becoming um, very popular and a driving force in, in government. So using alternative species, there were um, few or no animal welfare concerns. A lot of the alternative species were amenable to genetics and transgenics. Um, the assays were quick and the assays were inexpensive compared. And this just gives you an idea of what assays would cost. So a typical rodent study, you could use anywhere from 1,000 to 20,000 animals. Uh, we actually had a, a seminar once from um, a representative from an agricultural chemical company, and they did a pesticide study, and they used 10,000 rat brains um, to study the effect of their pesticide on neurodevelopment and a variety of brain activities. Um, at the end, they decided the, the pesticide was too toxic to bring the market, so um, the animals didn't really, well, you can judge what, how valuable the animals were. Um, but a typical rodent study can take anywhere from one to five years, can cost anywhere from two to five million dollars. Um, alternative species studies can go anywhere from 100 to 200,000 um, animals. The assays will take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, and the costs are about $1,000 per chemical. And that's probably at the high end. So alternative species, again, in, in um, precision tox, we're using uh, zebrafish, xenopus, Drosophila, Daphnia, C. elegans. Environmental, the relevant animals are fungulus and madaka. So now we'll get to the development of C. elegans as an alternative test organism, also known as worm tox. So just some background on C. elegans. Um, C. elegans is a non-parasitic nematode. The adult hermaphrodite is one millimeter in length and this movie is showing an adult hermaphrodite. It comes in one and a half sexes. Um, you can either get males or self-fertilizing hermaphrodites. Um, it's amenable to both classic and molecular genetic analyses. It has a small genome and it was the first multicellular organism to have its genome completely sequenced. It has about 25,000 predicted proteins. It's very easy to make transgenic animals with it. And work with C. elegans has netted three Nobel prizes, um, two in physiology and medicine, uh, one for apoptosis, the other for RNAi and one Nobel Prize in chemistry for um, the use of green fluorescent protein markers in biological organisms. An adult hermaphrodite has 959 somatic cells. Um, although it's got a limited cell number, it has a highly differentiated digestive system consisting of a mouth, a muscular pharynx, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, an intestine and an anus to remove the waste. Reproductive system has two gonads, which produce oocytes. Have a uh, spermathecas here, which produce sperm and uh, a uterus and a vulva. So here we're looking at uh, developing oocytes and the vulva for um, removing the animals. Um, it has a muscular system and a very defined nervous system. In fact, the the location innervation of every neuron in the animal has been mapped. And there's a really interesting um, or really good article published um, several decades ago mapping every neuron in the animal. Cell and development are understood in exceptional detail. The lineage from the fertilized embryo to the um, 
to the L1 larva have been mapped. So you can look at any cell in the animal and know what cell it's developing from and what cells it's going to develop into. A normal wild type C. elegans has a lifespan of 10 days and it has a three and a half day developmental cycle. So that's what this circle is showing. So it goes from fertilized embryo to reproductive adult in three and a half days. And in a few seconds, you'll see the miracle of birth of a worm. And at this point, we're right here in the, in the movie. So just a few of the conserved processes that are common between C. elegans and mammals, high conservation of basic metabolic proteins, the stress response, cell cycle control, multiple signal transduction pathways, um, has a variety of, of neurotransmitters. And elegans has been used as a model to study um, multiple human diseases, including cancer, ALS, lysosomal storage disease, polycystic kidney disease, um, Huntington's and Parkinson's and obesity. I don't know if you want to call it an aid, a disease, but elegans has also been used as a model to study um, aging. So I'm sure everyone wants to know how did worm tox begin? It began as a conversation between Chris Portier, who at the time was the associate director of the National Toxicology Program, and myself. So to play a little play, so Chris asked John if the NTP provided the funding. Could you develop C. elegans into a medium throughput toxicologic model? My response was, sure, not a problem. Chris's response was, okay, let's do this. Can you send me a budget before the end of the week? Thus, C. worm tox begins. And how did we get our name? Um, I was interviewed by a local newspaper in Durham, and the reporter and I came up with a, a catchy name for the article. So that's how we came up with worm tox. Um, so in 2004, um, the official document between myself and the National Toxicology Program had five tasks. Um, the three um, that were in bold, we did quite quickly. Um, so develop methods to measure toxicity of developmental and neurological toxicants, expose elegance to at least 200 of these toxicants and determine a variety of phenotypes, create or obtain GFP-based stress response transgenic nematodes. Um, we did task five, but it turned out it was not amenable to medium or high throughput. So we developed a high throughput way to analyze uh, C. elegans where genes have been knocked out using RNAi, but there were about 20,000 um, RNAi um, genes to knock out. So this just took far too long, so we kind of dropped it. And task four is actually what we're going to be doing now in precision talks. Um, at the time, again, we're looking at 2004, um, the method for high throughput microarray, RNA-seq wasn't even available back then. Uh, microarray analysis was just too much work for a small group to do. Uh, we hadn't established pipelines and things like that for data analysis. So this is it's kind of an important. So what I think led to the success of worm tox are these central concepts that we kept in mind during the development. So we would only sell for high quality data. It had to be sensitive, had to be specific and reproducible within and across plates as a function of time, as a function of the lot of the chemical and, and, and such. In fact, I was looking at some old data and we actually looked at reproducibility of the same chemical three years apart and we were 100% on target for the, our toxicity parameters over three years. So our system was very reproducible. Also, what we wanted to be sure is that the data acquisition group or the people actually working at the wet bench and the data analysis people worked together from day one. We didn't wanna have a situation where the wet bench people would start churning out data and then they'd hand it to the statisticians and the statisticians would have to figure out how to make it work. Um, so at, at the beginning, there was a lot of feedback between the data analysis and the data acquisition people. We needed to understand all the sources of variability and address them when possible. So this led to a lot of work in designing our plates and wells to minimize plate effects and well effects. 
um, looking at CLEN's biology and looking at variability in the equipment. Um, keep in mind at this time, we're now starting to look at thousands of animals per study. So we actually were able to find variability in the equipment. So I'll show some of the equipment in a few, few slides, but um, the equipment was hooked up to um, the house air supply and variability showed up as the pumps went on and off, maintaining air pressure. We also found that there was variability in the electronic detectors. So people who are familiar with high-end stereo equipment know that there's um, variability in the amplifiers, you know, the better the equipment, the less variability. So we actually found that this electronic variability um, contributed to the variability in our CLEGANS data. And the one thing we all kept in mind is that most of the people are not gonna understand what we're doing. The CLEGANS people are not interested in toxicology, they're interested in genetics, um, molecular biology, and that end of, of science. The traditional toxicologists still wanna use rats and mice. And we had this, the reason I wrote three years here is there was this running joke as we were um, developing worm tox is that because of the way we were working, we were discovering things that people just didn't understand. Like you cannot calculate LD50s and EC50s using traditional statistics. Um, people would go, oh no, just do it. Uh, we can do it, just go ahead and do it. Then about three years later, they said, you know, John, we just can't use those traditional statistics anymore. Um, so it became a, it was a little, a little annoying, but it did become a, a running joke. Um, so just to give some background on what the physical structure of worm tox looked like, we had two liquid handling robots, um, Beckman Coulter FX, Biomech FX, and Biomech 2000 upgraded to a 4000. And we used these for um, making master plates of our uh, chemical toxicants using 96 well plates or smaller. We had a variety, since it's the other we had a variety of microscopes. We had an inverted motorized scope, which you're seeing, seeing here. We had a variety of fluorescence dissecting microscopes and a confocal. And we used them for um, automating 96 well measurements, motion tracking, we could use them for size distribution, Z series and 3D rendering, which I won't talk about, and general phenotype characterization. We also had a, had a group looking at high content imaging. So we had an Image Express micro. Um, we use this for um, in vivo gene expression studies. The, the workhorse of our of worm tox is the COPUS biosort. COPUS stands for Complex Object Parameter, Parametric Analyzer and Sorter. Um, it can dispense C. elegans. It can also work with Drosophila, zebrafish, a variety of, of other small organisms. So it dispenses exact numbers at specific developmental stage. So it can count and sort nematodes, put them into a 96 well plate by specific developmental stage. Also, it can sort by fluorescence versus non-fluorescing animals. We used it for mutant screens, growth rates, population distribution, level of stress response gene expression, and our feeding assay. Basically, the Copus biosort is a fluorescence activated worm sorter. Uh, the worms would come in the top of the flow cell, the fluid would straighten it out, it would pass a pair of lasers, uh, one would be used to detect um, fluorescence, the other um, size and length of the animal. So the time of flight, which is the length of the animal or the time that the nematode interrupts the laser beam and extinction, which is the optical absorption as the animal passes through the laser. It would then go in through air and load into uh, 96 well plates. I just wanted to show what some of the data looked like so that we would get out of the biosort. And this is a C. elegans growth data. So the black dots here, each dot represents a single nematode. So these are the animals put in at time zero. After 24 hours, the animals have developed to the L2 stage. After another 24 hours, they're now L3s and L4s. 
And after another 24 hours or 72 hours, you now have adult animals. And we're also looking at the larva from these adults. Now we can look at the data as a, as a histogram plot. So here, log EXT or log of the optical absorption versus the number of nematodes. And again, here we're looking at um, the L1 larvae. Here we're looking at the L2s. Here we're looking at uh, threes and fours. Here we're looking at adults um, and the F2 L1s. This material down here is debris. Uh, nematodes shed their cuticle as they develop. So this is just the accumulation of uh, detritus. So the assays that we developed, um, we have medium throughput assays, we have um, high throughput assays. So looking at five chemicals per week, this is similar to what we're looking at with precision tox. And then we'll have um, 10 chem um, high throughput assays looking at 50 chemicals per week. But here we use a single dose response range for all of our chemicals. So just quickly to look through the assays, I wanna to get to the um, meat of the study later on. So we developed the reproduction assay. Um, here, we're basically taking L4 larvae, um, putting them in a plate for 48 hours and counting the number of offspring. This is what the data looks like. We're here, we're looking at the effect of DMSO on reproduction. These gray dots and this area up here are the adults that we've loaded. These are the offspring. And as you can see, as you increase the concentration of DMSO, the number of offspring decrease. So at two and a half percent, you have a fewer number down here and a 5.5% basically nothing. We can fit this data to a traditional hill plots. We can calculate EC50s and benchmark doses. Our feeding assay. Here, the feeding assay looks at the function of the pharynx, which is shown here. Uh, the pharynx has been used to model the human heart. It has a very consistent um, beat frequency. It has a self-contained neuron, um, nervous system. And it's been, like I said, it's been used to test um, for genes involved in heart disease and for genes affecting cardiac function. Again, it's a very simple assay. We take 25 adult nematodes, expose them to our toxicant for 24 hours. We add fluorescent microspheres, incubate for 15 minutes, kill the animals with sodium azide, and then we measure the amount of fluorescence. This image shows what we, what we see. So the fluorescent spheres will fill up the guts. So we can look at the fluorescence in the intestine. And again, here's our data. Looking at size, you see the the difference between zero and 267 micromolar cadmium is not that significant. The populations are quite similar. However, when you look at fluorescence and zero cadmium, you see a large um, array of fluorescence, whereas in the toxic levels where feeding is inhibited, most of the fluorescence is less than a thousand arbitrary units. And again, we can fit this data. Here we're looking at cadmium. Um, this is something that a lot of us in precision talks are seeing that when we do metals, the dose response kind of seems to have no effect, then almost goes to 100. Oops. Goes um, to 100% toxicity. However, when we looked at chlorpyrifos, um, a neurotoxic pesticide, um, you can see a logarithmic dose response effect. Our movement assay, again, very simple assay. We used transgenic nematodes. These contain GFP under the control of the pharyngeal myosin muscle promoter. This is what it looks like. This is a movie of nematodes, of myo2 nematodes. Each of these dots is a um, nematode pharynx. So we would take our nematodes, expose them to our toxicants, um, move 40 of these animals to agar pads and then read their motion for about 30 seconds. Um, this is what our motion looks like. You have normal sinusoidal motion and you can collect a variety of movement parameters. So frequency, height, distance, and so forth. 
we actually ended up using um, sperm motility software, which gave a, a lot of different measurements of distance, velocity, linearity, change of direction, and so forth. As it turns out, um, most of these parameters were affected the same way by the toxicants, so they were very redundant. This is just a quick series of data. So here we're looking at animals exposed to chlorpyrifos. This is zero or controlled, 0.1% or 0.1 micromolar, three micromolar. You're seeing a little bit of effect on motion. When you look at one micromolar, now you're seeing the paths are shorter, the very um, rough. And at 10 micromolar, the worms are pretty much not moving or just wandering around. Again, we can generate dose response data. Um, actually, it's known that at low concentrations, a lot of these neurotoxicants induce hyperactivity in the worm, which is what we see when we're looking at distance and linearity. Yeah, we see classic dose response effect. We did in vivo gene expression. Um, so here we're looking at dual colors. So we have green fluorescent protein, which is constitutively active. And then we have red fluorescent protein, which is driven by our promoter of interest. Here we're looking at a heat shock promoter. So here we have, oops, here we have you know, our background control fluorescence. Here we're looking at heat shock and here we can see the heat shock animal. Again, these are the same worms, just using two different fluorescence channels. Assay, basically expose the animals to chemicals, um, then use the Image Express to look at their fluorescence. So the high content plate reader. This is what the data would look like in each well. So you have a, a collection of worms looking at the green fluorescent channel and the red fluorescent channel. We use the worm toolbox. And I'm not gonna go through all these, a whole bunch of correction factors to linearize the animals so we can collect data. And this is what we ended up with. So a straight worm, we can look at the fluorescence as a function of concentration and as a function of position in the animal. So here we see that fluorescence kind of begins showing up the head, the higher concentration, it's brightest in the middle. Um, but we did not, really explore this very much because what we discovered is that with most of the genes, there's constitutive gene expression. So um, we couldn't really see difference, chemically induced differences in expression. And also the dynamic range was not that high, it's just a lot simpler for us to do everything by QRT PCR. So we kind of dropped the in vivo gene expression assays. So this is the meat of um, worm tox uh, growth assays. Again, it's a very simple protocol. We would take the worms, load them in a 96 well plate, we'd use 25 L1 animals, we'd incubate for 48 hours and measure the nematode size. Now, each plate contains six wells for treatment, and each treatment was repeated a minimum of three times. So, again, working with our statisticians, we, would, we had a pr protocol to do uh, quality control on each plate if the plate didn't pass quality control because of the um, control nematode wells we had on the plate, we would throw it away and run the assay again. Again, this is what the data looked like. Most of our work is using these uh, histogram plots. So the question we had to deal with was how do you determine the effect of a toxin on a C. elegans population? So again, another one of our running jokes was it takes a month to develop an assay. You've seen that the assays that we have are very simple. It's pretty much add worms, wait a couple of days, and then look to see what's there. Um, however, trying to do the statistics on how to analyze it actually took um, a while, and in some cases, years. And the statisticians are probably familiar with this quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful, which is kind of the way um, Things work during the CLEGAN's um, statistical development. So at the time, the standard techniques to determine toxicity, we would look, you would do ANOVA, linear, polynomial, or nonlinear regressions, splines, biologically based dose response. Um, these 
methods are good when you're using animals and you're looking at ends under 20 or under 50. However, when you're starting to look at high content imaging, so cells and nematodes, you're now looking at hundreds to thousands of, of animals per sample. Um, so application, these methods become complicated using in the high content um, environment. They're either too simple and they don't describe what's going on or they're too complicated to use for high throughput. If, if you're gonna start looking at thousands of chemicals, you can't really have someone look at every data set to see which type of analysis needs to be done or to manually curate the data or manipulate the data for analysis. You needed something to fit into a pipeline. So we decided to model C. elegans growth. So here we're looking at growth um, over 60 hours. So in each, each panel, the green line represents the L1 animals that we've added. The um, red line is the um, animals after a certain period of time. We have two functions. Um, this function removes the, the detritus, so things below the L1 animal. Anything smaller than an L1, we move it to garbage. Um, and then another one to model growth. And as you can see, as a function of time, the population shifts. So we're going, the peak is, you keep the constant, this bar shows um, the L4 line. So you can see that as time goes on, the population just shifts to, the, to larger and larger animals. So as things are developing, it's shifting to larger population. So now how do we model this process? We started with a variety of them. Um, we use ordinary differential equations. Um, there's a typo in this figure, if you can find it, good luck. Um, this didn't last long. Last night when I was looking through our, some of my old slides, I found the bathtub model. I didn't even know we could use this one. Um, we also tried um, Markov state um, model. So the Markov's model is a statistics, mo a stochastic model describing a sequence of events, looking at the probability of each event, depending on its previous um, event. Um, the reason I bring this one up is, is that it was kind of a joke. I presented this model at an international Congress. I, my background is not statistics. So there was a week where my, our stats group was explaining how this worked and what it meant. So I came back from the meeting and I told everyone that it was well, everyone loved it, it was well accepted. And the response was, oh, we're not using that anymore. You've gone on to something different. So that's how fast our models were developing and coming and going. Um, we also used isotonic regression. So we would fit an isotonic regression model to our toxicity data. So here we're looking at concentration and each of these dots are our population at that concentration and we came up with our own parameter for um, half response. Um, that one didn't go over very well with the toxicologists. They wanted everything at this point to be EC50s. Um, so our final model, which is what we did all of our screens which I'll talk about in a few minutes, was the effect size threshold model. And it asked the question, at which dose is the population distribution significantly different from the controls? So this is an example. So the blue line is the 48 hour control population. The black line are the L1s. So you start this at time zero, 48 hours, the population goes to here. And depending on our chemical, you can look at a 10% decrease from the control or 25% decrease of control. So we use the weighted T value, T test to compare our populations between the control and our treated. And this is um, how we did it. So we would have our control population. So again, we start with all animals down here, it waited 48 hours under, in the absence of chemicals, they would be at the um, young adult stage. In this, Figure we have an active chemical. So you can see that most of the animals have not developed past this stage. 
Um, this line is a, um, I think this is a 99% threshold. Here we are inconclusive. So we have some animals that have crossed the threshold. And in this example, we would define this chemical as an inactive because the majority of the population crossed the threshold. So now the analysis of the ToxCast libraries. So we first worked on the ToxCast 320. Back then it was called the ToxCast 320. It's now known as the phase one library. We did two different screens. So our first tier screen of this library. And just to give you a background, this is predominantly a pesticides active library. 309 unique chemicals, eight metabolites. Um, 291 pesticide actives, registered pesticides, 22 inert um, pesticides. So for the phase one screen, we exposed each nematode to 200 micromolar of the pesticide. This gave us a 1% DMSO concentration from a lot of our previous work. We knew that 1% DMSO would not affect nematode development. Then using our threshold screen, this determined at 200 micromolar, which chemical was active, inconclusive, and inactive. Just to give you an example of some of our pesticides. So we used two different um, cutoffs, a 95% probability and a 99% probability. So at the 99% probability, this would mean that 99% of the animals would cross the threshold or would become L, um, young adults. So here we would define a chemical as active using both the 99 and the 95% threshold. So this is the control peak. These are the unaffected adults. And you can see that the chemicals treated, all the animals were down here. Here is something, you did see some growth, but it didn't cross the threshold. So it's active. Um, here we have an example of a chemical that was not active. So at both the 99 and the 95% thresholds across the peak. Um, this is inconclusive or non-active depending on which threshold you used and so on. So going through the library, looking at our two different thresholds, we'd find that um, anywhere between, between um, 140 and 180 chemicals were active which is not surprising since the majority of this library are pesticide actives. Um, some of the chemicals were inconclusive and some were inactive. We then did a second tier screen. And in this screen, we use six concentrations, again, limiting things to using 1% DMSO. And the highest concentration we tested in our second tier was 100 micromolar. And we would, um, use the number of nematodes to calculate uh, linear slopes, and we normalized our um, absorption values to the control. And people have heard me say this during our meetings multiple times. We did not get normal dose response curves. We can't fit most of the data to hill plots. So for this chemical, you could fit it to a hill plot. Here, everything is not active until we hit a concentration where everything's 100% active. Here, things kind of wander around, it may be active, may not be active. And here, things kind of are upside downhill plot. And the, as we've gone through the screens, most of our data looks like this. So we can't really fit it to a hill plot. And since we're doing high throughput, we don't wanna to have to stare and look at each plot individually. So we came up with our own metric for determining chemical activity. Um, we looked at trends. So we would calculate um, a slope looking at a function of concentration versus the percent of control of animals which cross our threshold. Um, so you have a shallow, you can get positive, shallow negative, and really and uh, relevant negative slopes. This becomes important when we actually determine our activity scores. So we determined we came up with this activity score to look at each concentration and at every concentration where you had a better than 10 percent decrease in size you were given one point if your slope had if you had a negative slope you got one point if you have a larger negative slope you got an additional point 
you would sum up these points. And if your score is between two and nine, you were active. If your score was one, you were inconclusive. And if you had a score of zero, you were inactive. These are our activity scores using the highest concentration. We had about 94% of the chemicals active. Again, this is not surprising since we're looking at pesticides and most of them are active. You can then break this down and look how they scored and 19 of them were very active when it ranged down to um, very um, low activity. And how did they fall of the ones with the higher activity scores between six and nine? You had insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, and microbicides. So for the ToxCast phase two library, this was about 700 compounds, um, about 680 were chosen by the EPA in the National Toxicology Program. Um, 111 were donated. Then we had some plasticizers. We had replicates, um, triplicates from phase one and internal replicates. Just to give you a summary of what we found. Um, and here what we're looking at our size, uh, thresh, effect size threshold. So we asked the question at each concentration, um, how many of these chemicals cross the threshold? And or failed to cross the threshold. So at 0.5 micromolar, 19 of them, or 35 total. So these are extremely toxic to C. elegans. Um, 366 did not cross, were not, did not show any toxicity above 200 micromolar. So these were non-toxic to C. elegans. And then we have chemicals within in the range. We, uh, started doing some hierarchical clustering. Um, and of course you can't see it, but um, this is a blow up of this region. So as we expect, there are some, as the concentration increases, toxicity increases, and here we're looking at chemical classes. And you can look at the slides on your own to see which chemical classes show the highest toxicity in the nematode. But the work that we've started to do, which we found more interesting, is looking at concordance between C. elegans and other species. So we looked at C. elegans and zebrafish. Um, we have two different zebrafish libraries. The zebrafish T library are the chemicals examined by Robert Tangway, and the zebrafish P library are those um, examined by Stephanie Padita at the EPA. Um, and you can see that of um, and this is looking at the phase one library. Of the phase one chemicals, 119 overlapped all three organisms or the two zebrafish and elegans. Um, and then it broke down various ways. If you look at the classes of chemicals, so um, perethroids and such were toxic in both C. elegans and zebrafish. We had a few chemicals which were only toxic in elegans and a few chemicals which were only toxic in zebrafish. Now, for these studies, we're just asking the question, is the chemical toxic? Um, or does it show a, a significant toxicity response using the parameters of the, of the specific species test? We found that if you actually looked at dose, we did not find any concordance, which kind of is expected. We would not expect to see um, the same level of toxicity in zebrafish as we find in elegans. And we did a uh, um, similar analysis looking at um, C. elegans, zebrafish, rat, and rabbit. Again, um, if you look at elegans first compared to rabbit and rat, you do see some concordance. What's interesting, um, and we have a lot of data to look at this, is that the concordance between rabbit and rabbit was not much better than worm to rabbit or worm to rat. We see similar levels of concordance when we compare zebrafish to, to rabbit and rat and um, for the two zebrafish libraries. So here we're looking just a heat map by, by class. So we're looking at rabbit developmental toxicity, rat developmental toxicity, mouse cancer toxicity, elegans, um, rat maternal toxicity, rat cancer, and rabbit maternal 
And some of the chemicals are actually toxic across all species or have a high level of activity. And some are elegant specific, some are um, rat, rabbit um, specific. So to get near the end, these are all the chemicals that worm tox looked at over the years. Um, many of you know, my background is in metals. So there are a lot of metals. Um, a lot of these were just people coming up to worm tox and saying, could you test this for us? We also looked at a variety of libraries. We looked at flame retardants, ionic liquids, uh, fluorides. We were working with a group of dentists, uh, mitochondrial toxicants. And we looked at the tox one, tox 21 libraries with the tox one, tox cast phase one and phase two. And we also examined the NTP uh, 1408 library. So I didn't do any of the work, I just organized it. Um, the work was actually carried out, the wet bench work um, by Wendy Boyd and Julie Rice, who were phenomenally um, active in this project. Uh, Rachel Goldsmith was responsible for um, the in vivo uh, GFP gene expression assays. Paul Dunlap like oversaw um, um, just log general logistics. Um, again, our statisticians were phenomenal. Um, Mario Smith, um, who has PhDs in statistics and mathematics, um, Jason Perone and Sandra McBride. Um, you couldn't have done any of the work that I presented without their input. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, John, for this very interesting and fascinating presentation into the world of uh, C. elegans. Uh, now the floor is open for the audience to take a picture, uh, to, oh, sorry, to, <laughs> to take a, if you have any question, please raise your hand and I'd be happy to give you the floor. No questions. Oh, I see Christina. Uh, and I see Stefan as well. Okay. Uh, who wants to start? We'll start with Stefan since he's in the top corner of my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so great. Thanks a lot, uh, John, for this impressive talk. Um, I have a number of questions, but maybe let's start with one and the other maybe later. Um, since you looked at a number of different endpoints that may also indicate some mode of action specificities, I was wondering, how did you assess uh, the specificity of the responses? For instance, did you compare effect concentration on behavior to overt toxicity and then trying to find out how, how specific are the responses? Same for other parameters like reproductive uh, parameters. So, well, one part which may not be the answer that you're looking for is that across a variety of assays, the effective concentrations were comparable. So feeding, reproduction, things like that. These are complex biological assays. So an inhibition of feeding and reproduction could indicate a neurotoxin. So you need a, a the vulva is in, has nerves innervating, which releases the embryos. So um, but we did not explore modes of actions. Our goal was to develop these assays to look to see if we can measure toxicity in the animal. Um, I guess the mode of action part would have been looking at um, back then microarrays to see if we can figure out what was going on. But at this point, we were just similar to mouse studies, collecting phenotypes and see how quickly we could, could look determine effects and could we use these effects to, to rank chemicals and compare chemicals. Any other question? Stefan, you said that you had more. So. Yeah, ask away. Yes, if no one else is going ahead and I have a question and then Carsten. Maybe. Uh, so what's the future of worm tax? That's, that's my question. I mean, when you started almost nearly 20 years ago or so now, 
I mean, there had been a lot of developments in terms of automatization, throughput, high content analysis. Do you have a certain vision what may coming up in, in the future, for, for instance, when you showed this worm swimming and the video, I mean, it has such a nice and clear, transparent uh, uh, the, um, appearance that I thought that's maybe also something for kind of high content image analysis ba based on unlabeled uh, species. So what, what do you think is the future for for worm tucks. So um, using the biosorter and the, what, what I presented, it, I mean, they've increased the efficiencies of the biosorter. So what images I show were like version one, they now have a completely, they've completely re, remodeled it. Um, the issue with image, and we did try doing image analysis to sort populations. Um, and it comes down to throughput. We can do it a lot faster with the biosorter. So the biosorter, um, I mean, we're looking at 96 wells dispensing and counting, dispensing within 20 minutes and counting within an hour. You know, that's how long it takes to process the plate. And the data comes out um, quite, quite fast. I mean, it's on the, as on the fly. Um, image analysis, um, you can't count the plates that fast. Um, and analyzing the worm data is not that easy. It's, um, which is like why we kind of dropped the gene expression part. It's just, um, I guess we're looking for speed. So high content imaging of worms is not amenable to speed. <laughs> so, um, but we, again, we haven't looked back at this for, you know, five to 10 years. So it may be possible that the, the speed has increased. It may be worthwhile revisiting it. But um, then you have to balance, should we take another year and a half to figure out how to image worms and do the statistics <laughs> and model the growth and things like that or stay with what works. So it, a lot of it comes down to, to practicality. Yeah, Karsten. Yeah. And we also have a question. Yeah. Thanks for this nice overview, John. Um, actually, I was quite intrigued about this sort of, you know, comparison across species. So, I mean, you showed that for quite a, a number of chemicals, um, there was no species specific difference, right? So there was quite an overlap. And if we now think about mode of action, what would that tell us? Were those uh, actually metals where you say this is just kind of a direct acute toxicity? What type of chemicals were those? And and the other group, which basically shows species specificity, why is that? Is that due to certain receptors or metabolism? And, and to put it forward in the context of precision talks, shouldn't we look actually at a few representative of those chemicals where you have already very good indication that there is no species specific response versus a clear species specific response and, and, and do all mixed data on on those camels where you already obtained the data? So a complex question, but it goes back to the, you know, can we anchor it somehow to a mode of action? So to, to answer, 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 so we have selected chemicals in the chemical selection group that in theory will affect lower organisms, elegans, daphnia, maybe zebrafish, and then chemicals which won't affect them, but will affect higher organisms. Would that maybe due to receptor differences and, and, and things like that? Um, but we can't, so the, the animal studies that I showed were oral exposures um, because it kind of um, mimicked how the chemicals are getting into elegans. But again, we're looking at different ADME issues. I mean, not even looking at molecular differences. I mean, just routes of exposure, the, the endpoints that are available. I mean, we're looking at, for elegance, we're looking at growth. Um, for zebrafish, I think Stephanie looked at 10 or 12 different characteristics of zebrafish. So heart pumping, morphology, things like that. So trying to address why one chemical affected one species versus another, 
based on this data and what's out there now is, is difficult because no one's looking at a uniform um, phenotype. Right, yeah. okay, I see. Um, and and it, it's kind of like trying to figure out why things did and didn't work at this level is difficult. Um, but I think the way precision tox is organizing where we're going to look at similar concentrations and the data I showed just asked the question, did the chemical have an effect and didn't look at concentration effects and starting to look at the molecular level, that's when we'll be able to look at cross, do a better job of cross species comparison because genomes like we saw yesterday from Rob Smart, genomes have a lot of homology across them. So we'll be able to look at chemicals, effects across homologous genes um, in different species. Okay. Does that kind of get to your question? Yes, kind of. I mean, it all depends <laughs> on the phenotype as usual, right? Yeah, yeah that's just we're, we're limited, you know, we, we're we limited by what people are looking at. Yeah, so we started from scratch, you know, with this chemical selection. I was just wondering whether uh, at least some of those which were selected had some overlap with the ones you already tested in or did this cross comparison irrespective of the phenotype. But maybe it doesn't make any sense, you're right. I mean, yeah, totally different, different phenotypes. And now we try to standardize at least according to motility effects. Let's see whether this is more clever or smarter than than the other comparison, but we will see in five years, probably no, hopefully earlier. <laughs> okay, Brian has some questions, thanks. Oh, I, think, I think Peter, Peter was- Peter had a question, yes. Um, Peter? I'm I'm muted. Okay, uh, mine, mine isn't a scientific question. It strikes me that you're particularly well placed to answer my, my puzzlement about what, what is the reaction in the tox, traditional toxicology community to what you've done? That is, has the skepticism, level of skepticisms towards the use of non-mammalian organisms changed? Or particularly, I'm, I think I'm thinking about the United States because uh, Europe seems to be a little bit more open. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, that's what was my question is, no one's gonna understand, my comment, no one's gonna understand what you're going to do. So when we started, I mean, it was kind of like, okay, you know, we're giving John a few bucks from our budget, it's no big deal, um, but we're gonna test everything in rats and that's the way we're gonna go. Um, that has evolved over the years. So um, I think people are being dragged, kicking and screaming to realize that you can't do everything in rats, um, in rats and mice anymore. Um, people have, for, for whatever reasons, I mean, people are more accepting of zebrafish than elegans, maybe because they have a spine. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I mean, like I said, the, the Europe is much more advanced and they've kind of forced the issue. It's like, you have to, you can't use mammals anymore in your chemical testing. Therefore you have to come up with something else. In the States, the, you don't have that legislation. Um, and in fact, during one of the meetings, when we were talking with people at the American Chemical Council, their response was, until the government tells us we have to do this, we're not gonna do it. Um, you know, if, wow. if the standard are our rodent tests and that's what we're going to do, we're not going to waste our time and money on these alternative species. Um, but to, the future looks brighter and people are realizing that we have to do this. I think Horizon 2020 and Precision Talks and the European activities are driving the Americans as well, but there was a lot of resistance. Um, Thanks. Okay. Very clear. Was Any there? Question? No more question. Uh, well, I wanted to to let you know that most of the reference and data that uh, Jonathan presented to you today are, are are published. So if you if you want to to dig more into the topic, do not hesitate to drop me an email, and I will. I will uh, coordinate uh, sending you some reference if you want to, to know more. Um, there is also, we, we made a podcast together with uh, Jonathan on C. elegance uh, on VoxLab, which is available on the project website, precisiontalks.org. 
Don't hesitate to listen to it to, to discover some other information that were not presented today. And um, again, the meeting was recorded, so it will be shortly available on the project website, and I will send you an update uh, when it is by email. And more events are coming to present you the other organism species that we have in the project, Xenopus, Danu, and uh, Daphne Magna. So please don't hesitate to have a look at the website for more updates on this. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, everybody, Good for pleasure. coming today. And I wish you all a nice uh, afternoon and day, depending on which part of the world you were attending from. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Goodbye. So actually someone had a question in the chat. Oh, I didn't. It, no, no, no. It was just, uh, no, no, there were no, I didn't. Oh, it's, it was directed specifically right to me. That's why. Oh, oh sorry, my bad. Oh, it's OK. Do you remember who it was? Maybe we can. Uh... Okay. Um, Catherine Voigt. OK, I have, her, I have her email address. If you want, I can drop her an email. OK. She, yeah. Okay. Well, if they only sent it to you, then there's no way for us yeah. to actually know this. Yeah, no, no. I, I just was looking, like, looked at the well, chat. And she knows, uh, I mean, I, she has my email too because uh, I'm sending an invite through them. Okay. Um, I'll look through my, my um, stuff and I'll, I'll respond to her question. I just put it on my to-do list. She asked about pain and suffering. Um, <laughs> There's a, actually a, a, a story. Um, let's see. Um, when I got to NIH, someone decided I needed to put in um, IACUC paperwork. You know, mm -hmm. you know what IACUC is. It's um, it's the an animal protect people that looked at you looking at animal protocols. Mm -hmm. You know, usually it's done for mice and, and vertebrates. Um, but someone decided, well, you have to do one for elegans. So we did two. 